So um, thank you, and um, before I begin, I would just like to congratulate Josh um, and the wonderful team of graduate students that come together to comprise the public humanities at Western. The opportunities that they provide for all of us to encounter exciting research and engage in timely and important discussion is most certainly appreciated um, by all of your faculty as, as well as um, your peers, I know, so thank you. It is a um, high pleasure, a great pleasure, for me to introduce tonight's speakers, Aaron Manning and Brian Masumi, in this, the first of the Public Humanities Western series of March Blueprint Talks. For me, the timing of this um, talk is absolutely terrific. I've had my grad students um, working with their books for the past two years, and the students were very enthusiastic to learn that they would have an opportunity to hear the talk and to be a part of the ongoing discussion. Dr. Aaron Manning holds a University Research Chair in Relational Art and Philosophy in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia. She is a philosopher, cultural theorist, and artist with no one designation taking priority over the other. Tremendously prolific, um, even though you say you're a slow <laughs> scholar, <laughs> I'm tremendously prolific. Um, she has published four texts in the past decade. Ephemeral Territories in 2003, the year she joined the faculty at Concordia. Politics of Touch, Sense, Movement, Sovereignty in 2007, um, Relationscapes, Movement, Art, and Philosophy 2009, and her most recent publication, Always More Than One, Individuation's Dance, launched in Montreal on February the 15th. Forthcoming is a joint publication with Brian Masumi, Thought in the Act, Passages in Ecology of Experience. I believe that's the title. It's what I could come up with online. Um, I do know that the publication date uh, must be soon, and I'm waiting somewhat impatiently um, for its release date to be announced. So um, I, I'm looking forward very much to that. Um, Aaron Manning is also the founder and director of the Sense Lab, a lab that explores the intersections between art practice and philosophy through the matrix of, se matrix of the sensing body in movement. The lab is an innovative and active um, forum, and the events initiated under its umbrella of activities have very quickly become highly anticipated by scholars, artists, activists, um, both in Canada and abroad. Um, it, you, when you go in and look at what they're doing, it would be, um, it, it, um, it's a, a real tease if you can't get there because they are um, all, all over the world where they're doing these different events. Um, Brian Masumi has also been actively involved in the Sense Lab since its, its inception. Um, and Dr. Brian Masumi um, is a political theorist, writer, philosopher. He teaches, and I never know how to um, talk about what it is that you both do because um, these old uh, labels um, no longer suffice, um, nor, do, nor do they um, do justice to the kind of work that's being done. Um, he, is, uh, he teaches in the Communication Sciences Department at the University of Montreal. Um, Masumi came to the attention of scholars in the 1980s for his translations, which included Leotard's The Postmodern Condition, um, De Soterto's um, Heterologies, Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. Um, yeah, a, a, a Thousand Plateaus. Um, when in 1990, uh, and this is among others, I mean, if you look at their publication records, um, there's many more than what I'm speaking about tonight. Um, when in 1992 he published his User's Guide, Deviations from Capitalism and Schizophrenia, readers who did not already know his name stood, sat up and took notice. In particular, it was the text, Usefulness, that caught the attention, that caught and captivated its readers. Useful not in terms of information dissemination, but useful in its capacity to activate thought. The book did things as did every other Misumi publication that has followed. Parables for the Virtual and A Shock to Thought, both published in 2002, have now provided a decade of graduate and undergraduate students with concepts equal to the moment in which they live. These texts flow into a recent offering, Semblance, an event that's being passed around all over the place, and yes, that is what you saw. Um, on my shelf. Um, it's one of the texts that um, the grad students were working with, um, published in 2011, providing not only a shock to thought, but a call to attend and creative languages by which we might approach that which exists outside of thought. 
And I'm leaving so much out here, um, but let us move on to the main event. Um, Aaron and Brian's talk for uh, title for tonight is um, for a, pra a pragmatics of the useful. I wrote all of that before um, the usefulness before I knew what their talk title was, so I was delighted. Um, please join me in extending a really warm welcome to our guests. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it was such a beautiful introduction. Just before we begin, um, we wanted to say just a few words. And first, I want to um, thank you for making this possible. And I especially, you know, we've had a lot of thanks, but I want to draw out one person in particular who I'm lucky enough to have as a sister, Pascal Manning, who really was at the heart of making this happen with everybody else. She contacted me and in a very roundabout way asked me if there was a way that we could fit Western in. And um, it's true to say that um, it's been far too long since I've seen her and that this was really a ploy to see my sister. So I'm really pleased um, to be here, to be in her world. Um, and to be with you in the public humanities. Yeah, and th uh, thanks to Josh and the other organizers for, it's for a, a really, um, really very attentive and, and well-organized uh, beginning. Thanks. Um, so don't forget to speak in your microphone. Oh, yeah. Was that, was that loud enough? <laughs> 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 um, so uh, we we're just going to say a couple of introductory words. Um, this text, uh, which, we'd, which we just really finished uh, about last week, um, and in its full form, which you'll be very relieved to hear, we're not going to uh, present to you, is about 100 pages long, started uh, about 10 years ago um, with a, a kind of challenge when, when Aaron had started SENSAB when we were really thinking about the orientation. Uh, one of the pre people we turned to was Isabel Stengers, the philosopher who has a group uh, called uh, the Group of Constructivist Studies in Gecko. Belgium, Gecko. And um, I had heard her, you know, been, in, been uh, in correspondence with her about coming to do events from time to time. And uh, she had said at one point that she never came, uh, agreed to come to an academic event unless she thought it would actually live up to its name and be an event. And that stuck with me, so I thought I wanted to find out what, what that could mean. And, um, and we started talking about it. That invited her to spend a week in Montreal brainstorming with us around it. And that's when the Sense Lab, I think, decided on this course of a series of experimental format events, bringing together uh, concept work and hands-on creative practice. And, uh, uh, and the, the other thing was that she, uh, the, the text that you're going to hear was, sort of was in a way prefigured then because she said that when she thinks about collaborations between groups, and we we're already talking about that, although it actually hasn't come to pass, that uh, what she wants is for the other group or for both groups to have a kind of calling card where they talk about their process, talk about what she calls their obligations, how they're embedded in their practice and uh, in, in the relation to their milieu, and that before we would work with her group or even start talking about it, we would have to be able to produce that kind of calling card. And so this is the text that came of that, and it was used as a calling card uh, to uh, invite people into events and to just bring them up to uh, uh, up to date on what we felt we had learned and was, was, and was coming out of these events. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is um, <clears throat> the last chapter of Thought in the Act, which is what the, the actual longer text is called, Propositions for Thought in the Act. Um, but because, as Brian said, it's 100 pages long, we pulled out just a um, short, um, we sort of rewrote a shorter, a shorter text uh, for this presentation, um, and um, just to give you a sense of of the arc of the book, what Brian and I um, were interested in doing with um, 
he's stuck in his. Uh, I'm stuck in his yeah. Glasses. Yeah, I'm trying, uh, to, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying <laughs> to make sure he doesn't fall just before we start. Um, what we're trying to do with thought in the act is to really take seriously what Joy, what we were talking about earlier in terms of different kinds of um, ways of coming to knowledge, merging through the linguistic articulation, the philosophical, but also. Um, forms of knowledge that don't have the necessity to um, to articulate themselves linguistically, like n movement or texture or line. Um, and so each of the chapters comes from a long period of collaboration with an artist and tries to, or an activist, and tries to engage really uh, seriously with how they come to thought. And so that's why the book is Thought in the Act. So for this piece, um, that's what we did with the Sense Lab. And we're not, um, those names up there are truly the names of the people who speak with us and they don't cover all of the people. Um, it just took me so long to make that many different fonts that I didn't get around to adding everybody. <laughs> um, and. Uh the the kinds of the kind of work we do at the sense lab we consider to be useful in a way that we call in the title useless for <laughs> pragmatics is, of the useless this is a plea for philosophy done differently but remaining true to itself that is to say utterly gloriously useless done just for the intensity of thought the joy of being moved by thought for living thinking to the max. We are not going to argue philosophy's usefulness, but we are going to argue that it has a certain value, a certain force as an experimental practice of thought taken to the limit. What would it mean to take philosophy seriously, we are going to ask, as an experimental activity? What is most experimental is most useless. If something is truly new, the context for its use will not yet exist. It will create its own context, giving rise to new uses never before imagined. Philosophy as an experimental practice has to find ways to pull out concepts from the limit of the thinkable. It has to create new concepts. When it creates new concepts, philosophy is doing something. It is bringing new possibilities to thought and through thought to the world. A good philosophical concept is one that works itself out, unfolding outward from the limit of the thinkable, outdoing itself as it settles into the world. To do philosophy is to outdo ideas. To outdo itself, philosophy has to go outside itself. It has to get outside of navel-gazing. It has to out itself. One of the ways it can do this is by allying itself with other experimental practices where creative potential is in play. One such area is art practice. The Sense Lab, which I founded in 2003-04 in Montreal, is a laboratory for thought in motion. Its mission is to ally philosophy with art in ways that are not product-oriented, but celebrate the intensity of the uselessness at the heart of both practices. We approach this use uselessness as a call for the creation of alter economies that take seriously that art is a thinking in the doing, just as philosophy is a doing in the thinking. We bring them together in transdisciplinary encounter in ways that unleash new tendencies that might unfold, potentially taking political expression. Through an event-based practice, we explore the limits of thought where art, philosophy, and potential politics intersect. We call this activist philosophy. Activist philosophy is a strange animal, a speculative pragmatism, speculative in the sense of connecting to potential, thought at the limit facing the future, and pragmatic in the sense of actively endeavoring to work itself out to new inventive effect. One, construct the conditions for speculative pragmatism. What is pragmatic is always speculative in the sense that what will come, that what will come of the process is always an open question until it settles into the world, taking determinate form and finding function. En route, it is effectively speculating on its own unfolding. For the Sense Lab, the question of the speculative was originally organized around the concept of research creation. Specifically, it was organized around a reorienting of the concept of re research creation away from its commonly assumed goal of creating cultural capital, reorienting it towards a philosophico-artistic thinking in the doing. 
We took the hyphenation between the philosophical and the aesthetic seriously, seeing it as an internal connection rather than an external coupling, a mutual interpenetration of processes rather than a communication of products or even expertise. This approach posits research creation as a mode of activity of its own kind in its own right, taking hold at the constitutive level of both art practice and theoretical research at a point before research and creation diverge into the separate institutional structures which capture, capture productivity to control and contain it and judge the results by prevailing criteria, which in a world where the economic is fast becoming the obligatory model for all activity means producing added value. At the constitutive level, pre-divergence and containment, making is already a thinking and action. And conceptualization, a bona fide, how do you say that, bona fide or bona, bona fide. fide? Sorry, Brian wrote this sentence. And uh, conceptualization, <laughs> a bona fide practice in its own right. The two we proposed can be made to intersect in technique. Here, technique is understood as an engagement with the modalities of expression a practice invents for itself, after its own kind, and not only the tools it uses. Our speculative starting point was that this meeting in technique, to be truly creative, would have to be constitutively open-ended. The kinds of results aimed at would not be pre-programmed. They would be experimental, emergent effects of an ongoing process. In its own small way, the Sense Lab aims to experiment artfully and philosophically with this interfolding of modes of doing and thinking. For us, the useless is never passive or nihilistic. It is experimentally creative, always in the act. Our basic premise is that experimentation happens. It's of the nature of an event. We understand doing as a thinking in the act, and the act of thinking as composing potential for the doing. The event for, which this, for the Sense Lab is not the all is done and over with. We understand as a staging of forces, we understand it as a staging of forces of incipiency, as that which articulates the coming to expression of a process that will continue and transform. As with Alfred North Whitehead's concept of the actual occasion and Deleuze's concept of the event, we locate the event as the crucible of lived experience. There is no lived experience prior to or outside its actualization in the event. The event is the inact through which the conditions of experience are felt as such and play themselves out always with a difference. To catalyze the inact of the event, it is necessary to create the conditions for the experimentation to occur. Techniques, we think, are the conduit for conditioning. Two, invent techniques of relation. For a philosopher of science, Gilbert Simondon, the concept of technique itself includes the idea of the conditions through which a work of practice, or work or a practice, comes to a definite technical expression. Technique is therefore processual. It reinvents itself in the evolution of a practice. Its movement toward definite expression must be allowed to play out. Technique is therefore imminent. It can only work itself out following the momentum of its own unrolling process. This means that what is key is less what ends are pre-envisioned than how the initial conditions for unfolding are set. The emphasis shifts from, pragmatic, from programmatic structure to catalytic event conditioning. Techniques as we understand them do not depend exclusively on the content of a given practice, but move across their respective processes at the site of their potential multiplication. A dance practice, for instance, will emerge across various registers. A movement exploration might co-combine with a conceptual force, a word, an idea, a landscape, influenced perhaps by past explorations and changed probably all along its course by improvisatory explorations that connect to the experiment's technical constraints. Similarly, a philosophical practice will emerge in and across a reading-writing register that cannot be restricted simply to content. Like the dance practice, the philosophical exploration is a technique in its own right, activated and activating across registers of content and processual invention, moving incessantly between the rigor of denotation and the force of expression. How a practice moves across these registers is a question of technique. The Sense Lab seeks collectively to find modalities of experimentation that connect practices imminently at the level of their intense 
cre intensive creative force. This is not done in order to map them onto one another or evaluate one in terms of another, but to propose a co-causal thirdness of exploration which can be generative of new modes of practice and inquiry. It is a temptation of the institutions in which we work to ask what the real work is, assuming that they already know how to recognize it. There's a suspicion about the vocabulary of techniques as though creating conditions for processes catalyzing into an event is a substitute for the real work, a way of warding off uncertainty about our capacity as practitioners dedicated to the speculative to really do anything at all. Conditions is an essential part of the vocabulary for pragmatics of the useless. Conditions activate, they animate, they set in motion, but they have no specific goal in mind, and in that sense, they have no use value. They produce no recognizable value added. Rather, they create the condi conditions for values to come. Techniques orchestrate the field of relations such that an event may trigger that opens the way for an as yet unthought and, as we mentioned above, the as yet unthought must not conform to predetermined stakes. It must create its own stakes. While this has become clearer over the nine years of the Sense Lab, the importance of uselessness was already built into our first event, Dancing the Virtual, in 2005. Already, as we conceived it, the success of the event would be measured not by any easily presentable product produced during its three-day duration, but by whether there was follow-up on its process afterwards. In other words, by whether the event itself had set anything in motion that might gather its momentum. The follow-up might take various forms, unforeseen cross-practice collaborations initiated at the event, other groupings elsewhere taking up the concept and practice of techniques of relation in the context of research creation, or other hybrid meeting grounds, or increased international networking between groups already working along similar lines. We didn't expect that Shirk would value our approach to value, and so we never sought funding. Instead, we focused on the catalyzing of a continuing collective culture dedicated to an ethics of engagement. We wanted to set into motion something that could grow and take us with it. In short, the event would be evaluated according to what it seeded rather than what it harvested. Three, design enabling constraints. At a typical Sense Lab event, there might be 50 or more people who come together from different areas. Dancers and choreographers, as well as philosophers, new media artists, and literary theorists, poets, and sound artists. There will be students and professors, people from inside the university and people from outside the university, writers, practicing artists, community activists. Given this diversity, the core techniques must be what we call techniques of relation, ways of bringing people convivially together in their diversity. Techniques of relation always involve, we think, an element of hospitality. Since the Sense Lab's goal was to collaboratively catalyze movement toward the emergence of the new, the role of the techniques of relation would not be to frame the interaction in the traditional sense. The techniques would be for implanting opportunities for creative participation, which would be encouraged to take their own shape, direction, and momentum in the course of the event. The role of the techniques of relation was to create conditions conducive to the event earning its name as an event. These would have to be of two kinds, techniques to set in place propitious initial conditions and to te techniques to modulate the event as it moved through its phases. In keeping with our concern for incipience and open-endedness, the paradigm would be one of conditioning rather than framing. The difference is that conditioning consists in bringing co-causes into interaction, such that the participation yields something different from either acting alone. The reference is to complex emergent process rather than programmed organization. Emergent process dedicated to the singular, the occurrence of the new, agitates inventively in an open field. Programmed organization, on the other hand, func functions predictably in a bounded frame and lends itself to reproduction. A term was adopted for relational technique in its role as event conditioning, enabling constraints. An enabling constraint is positive in its dynamic effect, even though it may be limiting in its form function narrowly considered. Take, for example, an improvised dance movement. The major constraint is the action of gravity on the body. As a cause, gravity is implacable, its effects entirely predictable. 
But add to gravity another order of cause, and in the interaction between the orders of determination, something new and unforeseen may emerge. A horizontal movement cutting across the vertical plane of gravity can produce a certain amount of a certain quantum of lift temporarily counteracting gravity's downward vector. The arc of the jump will be a collaboration between the action of gravity and the energy, an angular momentum of the horizontal movement acting as co-causes. Add to the mix priming of the dancing body by techniques for entering into the movement and modulating it on the fly, including techniques of attention and concentration, as well as conceptual orientations. And a third order of co-causality actively enters in. Gravity has been converted from a limitative constraint into an enabling constraint, playing a positive role in the generation of an event favorable to the improvisational emergence of a novel danced movement. Enabling constraints concern forces before forms or functions. They tap into forces and entangle them toward creativity. This model of the enabling constraint was adopted for every aspect of the event generating strategies for dancing the virtual and was retained for all subsequent events. We wanted to avoid at all costs the voluntaristic connotations often carried by words like improvisation, emergence, and invention. There would be no question of simply letting things flow as if simply unconstraining interaction were su sufficient to enable something creative to happen. In our experience, unconstrained interaction rarely yields worthwhile effects. Its results typically lack rigor, intensity, and interest for those not directly involved, and as a consequence are low on follow-on effects. Effe effects cannot occur in the absence of a cause. The question is what manner of causation is to be activated, simple or complex, functionally prescribed or catalyzing a variation, linear or relational and co-causal? Oops. Four, disseminate seeds of process. By the end of our second event, Housing the Body, Dressing the Environment, 2007, it was clear that we needed to come up with a new technique for collective grouping. This technique would build on earlier techniques of event-generated and event-generating hospitality adapted for larger groups. This would allow us to welcome new people since, to our initial wonder and surprise, all but one of the participants from Dancing the Virtual had opted to participate in Housing the Body, making it difficult to welcome new participants within our interactive research creation format. There was also the problem of the episodic, exceptional nature of the events. This had initially been a strength. The first two events extracted participants from their embeddedness in the everyday of the local contexts, creating a vista for acting and thinking otherwise. Now, however, the strength of the events began to feel, in some ways, like a limitation as participants returned to their home environments without necessarily being able to find ways of following up on momentum they might have found through the event. Collaborations did spin off in a number of cases, but as long as the problem of how to propagate the techniques of relation that had been collectively invented through the events was not addressed, the collaborations were left exposed in contexts sometimes hostile to the carrying forward. The limitative political, economic, intellectual, and institutional constraints that produced the need to seek engagement elsewhere in the first place threatened to clamp back down as soon as participants ret returned to their home, ter home turf. It was clearly time to experiment further. How could the collectively produced techniques for transformative ethics of engagement be disseminated outward into participants' respective home environments in ways singularly self-adapted to each habitat? How could the processes we were collective re collectively creating, which, which we're sort of skipping over to talk about the second event. Third. Third event, also open itself to non-academics or non-professionals who did not have access to travel funding how could this dissemination be effectively spread to groups that had not been involved in prior Sense Lab events? For each event, much consideration goes into the question of how to take into account the inaugural passage, the initial passing of the threshold into the event. A major determinant to the success or failure of the event, we believe, is what participants bring with them through the threshold to the event in terms of expectations about the coming group interactions and their individual status and positioning within them. How the initial entry is organized, and especially the physical layout and affective tonality of the space in which participants enter, influences the postures that will be assumed. The manner of welcome and the initial impression created of the space of participation are essential working parts of the event machinery, not neutral accessories. 
Together, they constitute an apparatus, a postural priming that embeds certain presuppositions and anticipatory tendencies in the events unfolding. The challenge for each event is to disable participants' habitual presuppositions, those tendencies ingrained in all of us by the conventional genres of interaction in the art and academic worlds. The passing of the threshold into the event has to signal that what is coming is different from the norm and that the usual rituals of self-presentation and self-positioning based on achieved reputations and disciplinary statue, statue, stature will not be encouraged. This has to be done in an inviting and even comforting way. A kind of hospitable estrangement is necessary. For the welcome, the model of hospita hospitality was explicitly adopted, rather than the more usual one of gatekeeping and accreditation, registration, identification by institutional affiliation, etc. The Sense Lab's proposition is that there are other ways of coming together that are tangential to identity and professional positioning, intersecting with them up to a point, but enacting tendencies that are not reducible to them, following trajectories that exceed their limitative frame. The idea is to find ways of coming together that do not cement us to our pre-formatted ideas of what we have to bring and who we will be for the event. Instead, we endeavor to create technique-driven encounters transversal to the identities in play, rather than in denial or in opposition to them. Since that, participants are invited to bring their care, their concerns, their affinities, their passions, and most especially their techniques, in which the, te the techniques in which these are performatively invested, and to enter the event along these vectors, thereby co-composing with the event's own emergent modalities of hospitality. For the third event in the series, Society of Molecules 2009, the focus would be on strategies of participation that would explore the potential of staging a distributed event that would enable people to participate without traveling to Montreal from around the world. This was done to make the event more affordable, but also as a way of minimizing the environmental side effects of travel of air travel. The distributed nature of the event made developing techniques for event-based hospitality an even greater concern. For not only did we have to find ways to manage the crossing of the threshold, we had to do so across multiple thresholds at a distance from each other scattered across 17 cities in 15 countries with dozens of participants, including quite a few new to the Sense Lab Collective. We would have to design a technique that would allow us to mutually interact and influence one another without the need for a face-to-face -face encounter. The problem was how to distribute self-organizing creative energies carrying potentially transformative force while operatively interconnecting them at a distance. Society of Molecules was conceived around local propositions. Each local event would creatively address a political aesthetic issue felt by local participants to affect the quality of their lives. The political element referred to formative or organizational forces that were active in each local environment, but extended beyond them in a way that placed them in connection with other locales. Examples might be forces of redevelopment or economic stimulus that palpably changed the culture of the city, forces propelling or responding to the movement of people across borders, environmental issues as they play out locally, issues of urban planning and the conviviality of public spaces, the potential of local derelict spaces for alternative cultural initiatives, adapting strategies from other emplacements, or linking into earlier political movements for local empowerment. Our proposition was that these larger forces be addressed from the specific angle of their local effect, but in cognizance of their wider significance, and with an active attempt to bring their translocal di dimension differently into play. As with our previous events, Society of Molecules had a lead up of a year during which molecules were created across the world. Molecules were defined as a group of seven to 10 people who would take on a collective project for aesthetico-political intervention that would creatively address an issue felt by local participants to affect the quality of their lives. The interventions would last between three hours and seven days and take place during the first week of May 2009. No constraint of any kind was placed on the content of the interventions in keeping with the earlier events problematization of the danger of content-based distinctions for a generative process. Neither was any con there any constraint on the form the interventions would take. Form and content would be entirely determined locally, but in a way open to the contagious influence of other lo local groupings. The early stages of the event were steeped in practices from prior collective Sense Lab organizing. We read assigned texts, we created an internet hub for concept invention, we collectively thought about the relation between art and politics, and we worked locally to develop ideas for our own molecular projects. 
Then we began to conceive of specific techniques for the larger distributed event, always with a focus on developing strategies that would allow us to connect at the level of our processes rather than focusing on content and thereby falling into the trap of reporting, the misconception that process can be reduced to the communication of information. Three techniques were invented. For this invent, event, the technique for crossing the threshold hybridized into one modeled on diplomacy. This was the technique of the emissary. Each molecule was invited to choose an emissary as well as to name a host. The emissary of each local grouping was paired with the host of another group. Sometime in the next five months, in the five months preceding the main event, the emissary would travel to the host group, although virtual voyages were a possibility where re resources did not allow physical travel. The role of the em emissary was to make first contact with the other local molecular culture. To facilitate the unannounced meeting, pro movement profiles were compiled and distributed to the emissaries. The movement profiles described the designated host's habitual daily movements through the city so that if the emissary so desired, first contact could be made in a performative fashion taking advantage of the element of surprise. Although contacts were provided, emissaries were not encouraged to use standard forms of communication like cell phones and addresses, but to focus instead on being guided by the movement profile. Upon meeting, the host's job was to gather the molecule together and treat the emissary to a relational soup. The relational soup technique was designed to reinvest reporting with process and invention. Given the distributed nature of the event, reporting could not be completely avoided, but it could be oriented away from a content-driven approach and intensified. Once the emissary made first contact with the host, the, ho the host had to gather together the local molecules within 24 hours to share the relational soup the host molecule had devised as a collective activity integrating the emissary. The recipe for the relational soup would then be brought back by the emissary to the home molecule. The relational soup could be anything at all, the default option being an actual soup. The constraint was that whatever form the soup took, it should give the emissary and its home molecule a taste of that group's process. A third technique had to do with disseminating the process in a way that prolonged it beyond the week of local interventions. This technique to the, took the form of a process seed brought back from the emissary, uh, brought from home by the emissary and left with the host group. The seed was sealed and was to be opened only after the event. It was something that would need to be tended or cared for by the host molecule. It could be an object around which a future group activity could be organized or a set of procedures to be followed collectively, or it could be a seed. The local interventions took many forms. To give just a few examples, and all of these are on the inflections uh, issue three, um, the San Diego-Tijuana molecule addressed immigration issues around the U.S.-Mexican border. They hijacked a public telephone booth on the Mexican side and converted it into a free phone by patching the connection into Skype. Mexicans deported from the U.S. or encountering difficulty entering were invited to use the phone to notify friends and family or to call for help. The Amsterdam group addressed issues of ecology and food practices. They foraged for edibles growing in the city and prepared a collective meal from what they found in the urban environment. One of the Montreal groups spent time observing the life of derelict spaces in the city slated for redevelopment. Who used them, how they used them, the patterns of movement through them, the policing of them. They joined in the patterns of movement and tried to organize participatory encounters that gave a gift of conviviality to the ephemeral community they found. Among these was a lack of information booth, inviting the public to explore the missing links between the official view of the city and its redevelopment and the ground level forms of life filling the pores in the urban fabric. The Hull molecule performatively and ironically addressed feminist issues celebrating the vagina dentata. Overall, what we were looking for were techniques to string together the specificity of local interventions with a speculative platform for thought that would emphasize not the event's use value, but its capacity to generate new conceptual directions that might, over time, open the way for a reorientation of the very notion of value. To address the conceptual level directly, all SenseLab events involve preparatory online philosophy reading groups and concept work sessions during the event for which specific techniques have also been invented and are in constant evolution. Our favorite is called conceptual speed dating. 
the concept of value was taken on as an explicit guiding concern for the fourth event in the series, Generating the Impossible, from 2011. We wanted to link the question of value to an ethos of care in the event for the event. This involves construing value as a process, valuation, not evaluation. Valuation is how the event values its own coming to expression and how the ethos of care it generates might prolong itself to create a collective investment in potential politics. Valuation is a proto-politics in the making. The care involved is not a personal quality or private subjective state. It is a collective practice of care, an inactive, technique-based concern for the event in its unfolding. We consider care to be an impersonal technique for an ethics of, of engagement. Five, practice care and generosity impersonally as event-based political virtues. The impersonal concept of care at the heart of all sense lab events is, its, is a rejection explicitly of the notion of the common. Care organizes itself not around the common, but around the irreducibly singular. It concerns being different together and becoming together as an expression of those differences as part of a shared process. Care, as care for the event, assumes no commons in the sense of an equality of access to a valorizable resource. It assumes no commonality or ethos of consensus in the sense of general characteristics or convictions shared by all. And it assumes no community in the sense of, de of a defining identity that precedes and determines the collectivities coming together and sets a priori boundaries to that convergence. All it assumes is the eventful integration of collective invention in and for the singularity of the event for only as long as the event sustains its own self-organizing process. What it cares for is not the individual, but the event's capacity to make felt the force of its attunement to new modes, to new modes of existence. Six, play polyrhythms of relation. A new mode of existence is an emergent attunement. Each of our events seeks to provide a field of action for an emergent attunement. This, the notion of emergent attunement as we practice it is adapted from the work of Daniel Stern. Attunement, as Stern conceives it, is more polyrhythmic than harmonic. In a harmonic musical chord, the singularity of the notes is subsumed into the global effect of their coming together. Their diversity disappears into the unity of that effect and into its structural function in the larger organization of the piece. An attunement in Stern's sense does not subsume the singularity of the contributing actions that come into relation, even as it brings them together to joint effect. This is attunement, a polyrhythmic coming differently together through the same event, carrying the event's field of emergence through its unfolding in such a way that its having happened becomes a co-cause of what follows without in any way modeling it. For generating the impossible, we work directly on techniques for emergent attunement. We would need a technique to prevent the attunement from settling into a harmony or a, mo a monorhythm, reducing the difference in play to a common thread. That technique was called the free radical. In physiology, the free radical is an unbonded oxygen molecule loose in the body. Free radicals are a natural byproduct of the body's life-sustaining metabolism. But due to their high reactivity, they may also interfere with the body's regulated functioning by destroying the bonds between molecules, releasing still more free radicals. For free, for free radicals possess a bond dissociation energy, a contagious power of destruction imminent to the very process which ass assures organic functioning. The role of the free radical for generating the impossible was to break down the emergent attunement after it had just emerged, but before it could stabilize into a self-sustaining harmony that might assert itself as a model. The free radical was envisioned as a kind of trickster figure who would intervene in the event's emergence, preempting too unified an organization. The free radical would infiltrate the event space with a joyfully affirmative bond association energy. Ideally, this frustrating of organic harmonic attunement would not be a purely destructive tendency, but rather a proposition for an alter economy, a way of collectively reorienting the event toward a valuation of emergent modes of experience. Seven. Seven, explore new economies of relation. So I should just say here that Generating the Impossible was the final event in the series, and that was part of why we, didn't, why we were so concerned about the, um, the form of the event taking itself on as a model. We approached the question of value from the angle of the relationship between uselessness, thought, and invention. 
This can only lead us back to the question of capitalism and to, to the question of alter economies we might be able to invent to coexist with capitalism or to trip it up so that it might tumble toward a future beyond itself. Capitalist economy subsumes all forms of value to monetary valuation. It also builds into its definition of value an imperative to quantitative value adding, surplus value. The capitalist economy is formally dedicated to quantitative growth over and above all other values. Capitalist techniques of relation are without exception mechanisms of accumulation. In the interests of accumulation, it captures and subsumes non-capitalist formations. When the capitalist economy subsumes other economies of experience, it is not just capturing monetary value, it is capturing processes of collective individuation. It is capturing entire fields of emergent relation. It is capturing powers of becoming, subsuming them, sometimes gently, more often brutally, to techniques of relation dedicated to quantitative value adding and accumulation. The Sense Labs event series was always destined to compose with and around capitalist capture to invent new lines of flight or reinforce existing ones for a lived glimpse of a non-capitalist economy. If capitalism is a universal process of capture, there is no simple way out. All activities are at some point, in some way, taken up in it. But if capitalism is also singularly inventive of new forms of relation, as contemporary post-Marxist theories assert, then despite this complicity, there are, uh, there are emergent forms of life always on the make, which might come to assert greater autonomy. The result can be a leakage in the system, lines of flight toward a non-capitalist future. To catch a glimpse of this future in the present, it is necessary to decouple valuation from quantitative evaluation. This means decouple, decoupling value from the two forms of value capitalist eco economics use, uses to quantify it. Not only use value, but also exchange value. Exchange value is based on a founding myth, that of equal exchange, as mo measured by money as abstract medium of equivalency. All economies involve exchange. Yet, according to Deleuze and Guattari, exchange is only apparently organized according to a principle of equivalence that is applied punctually in each act of exchange between two individuals. In the most basic example, an equivalence between a good of one kind or another, realized punctually in a trade. Exchange, though, is not punctual. It has a serial order that implicates a collectivity. The series of exchanges, Deleuze and Guattari argue, is in fact organized as a function of a limit. The limit is, quote, the idea of the last objects received or rather receivable on each side, end quote. Last here does not mean, quote, the most recent nor the final, but rather the penultimate, the next to the last, the last one before the apparent exchange loses its appeal for the exchangers or forces them to modify their respective assemblages to enter into another assemblage, end quote. The limit idea is therefore qualitative. The limit idea of the next to the last exchange after which the series of exchanges changes intuitively informs each punctual act of trade. Thus, there is a qualitative evaluation that underlies each so-called equivalence produced by a trade and sustains the possibility of the series of exchanges continuing as before. The appeal of sustaining the exchange activity is essentially the desirability of sustaining the way of life, the mode of experience associated with that which is exchanged. Take to listen Guattari's example of the alcoholic. In the process of drinking, each drink exchanged by the alcoholic for money is, to some extent, the potential last drink. If the potential lastness, the limit idea, is not skillfully negotiated, the drinking process and the forms of pleasures, pains, and social interactions associated with it will not be sustainable. For the process to continue, the last drink must not be the last, but the next to the last. The last drink will be, would, would take the alcoholic over the edge into a new relational field harboring other relational qualities and implying another mode of existence. If the penultimate is passed and the limit reached, the alcoholic will cross the threshold from intoxication to, for example, alcohol poisoning. The threshold will have been passed from a form, from form of life to life-threatening breakdown, as in liver failure. Across the threshold, new relational fields await, not least the hospital. For life to get back on its feet, it must find a new way perhaps Alcoholics Anonymous, 
What last means must be continuously recalibrated. The limit will be relative to any number of factors, the speed of the drinking, level of fatigue, stress level, and the quality of the company. The intuitive evaluation of the qualitative limit will imminently modulate the relational field of alcoholic experience. If the limit is not reached, the drinking will rebegin, following its own rhythm of intoxication and sobering up. If the threshold is crossed, the result may prove disastrous or healing. The necessary rebeginning might be to move toward abstinence. Now life itself will have to function as its own power of intoxication, undoubtedly altering the field of relation and form of life. The point is not that drinking is good or bad. That kind of moral evaluation is made according to criteria extrinsic to the process. The imminent evaluation of the process concerns only its continuing in the same relational field or a switching of fields and forms of life and form of life. When the process continues, it is because it has succeeded in affirming its own operations through an imminent, qualitative, self-modulating evaluation. When it passes the threshold toward change, it poses the existential question of what germinal form of life and future qualities of experience lie beyond the threshold. Although neither good nor bad a priori, in whatever way the limit idea plays out, the imminent evaluation it involves is never neutral. Ideally, it contributes to sustaining and modulating or regerminating forms of life. This makes it, of itself, a creative factor and force of life. For an event generating practice such as the Sense Lab, this raises the question of how the heterogeneity of forms of life co-composing the event enter into polyrhythmic conversation. What manner of attunements will emerge? What modulations will some forms of existence capture or annex others? Will the forms of life entering the mix find ways of sharing or exchanging limit ideas so that the relational fields meld or enter into symbiosis? Will a new limit idea, never before occurring, emerge from the singular playing out of the polyrhythmic relational field of the event? Will the component processes uh, attune to a limit idea they invent among themselves across the relation, composing a collective individuation of each and all together? This raises for art and activist philosophy the question of the alcoholic. What aesthetico-political iteration might be the last glass? If that limit is reached and a threshold crossed, what necessary rebeginning lies beyond? What intoxication of new life awaits? Eight, for a pragmatics of the useless. The aim of the sense lab is to catalyze a collective limit to catalyze collective limit experiments in artistic activity, flirting with the thresholds of art's relational field, making felt what thresholds vibrate in it. What field of relation might lie beyond the threshold is a question that underlies each of our events. Whatever it is, if it has succeeded in making felt the constraints of capitalist forms of value, one thing is certain, it will have been political. Each event is an exercise in the potenti potential becoming political of art at its limit and beyond its threshold. To the extent that the approach to the limit succeeds in enacting a collective qualitative economy when it is self-affirming as a polyrhythmic form of life, the politics foretokened will be potentially anti-capitalist. An anti-capitalist event-based practice cannot have predetermined use value. This makes it largely unfundable within the current granting structures based on knowledge mobilization for the capitalist creative economy, nor does it fit within the constraints of the art market, which trucks with exchange value spiked with a pre-capitalist form of qualitative value, prestige value. We resist both these orientations, even as we work in and around university and art contexts toward new forms of collective life in the making. In the making, is contrary to uselessness, you might say. But that's really the point. The uselessness is not without activity. A plea for uselessness is a refusal to conform to already established models of knowledge and the expectation of value-adding the, value newest new of the capitalist economy and the art market that is necessarily complicit with it. A plea for uselessness is a call for action but in its capacity to create not new forms of life directly, as if the future were just another value-added product, but the collective conditions for their potential emergence. It is to call, a call to be speculatively pragmatic at each stage of the collaborative process, resisting the urge to congeal experimentation into a pre-modeled form. 
It is a call to a process-generating activity that delights in the germinal forms it, events, it invents, but does not use the forms to define how the process must evolve. It is the activity of enabling a collaborative process to create its own context in which to live up to its own value from within its own unfolding. It is a call for an alter economy of creative activity that remains stubbornly unquantifiable, lived less for the value added to a product than as a value in itself. It is difficult to assess the outcomes of a practice that produces no measurable value. Uselessness may not have predefined outcomes, but as mobilized for creative process, it does have effects that can be informally assessed. With the sense lab events, the quote, measure of success is the intensity of the next event, this one seeded, as well as the creative partnerships formed through sense lab participation spinning off into extra sense lab collaborations. The sense lab's value is centrifugal, the seeding of processual spin-offs. The truest measure of the Sense Lab's success are successes for which it cannot claim credit. Its most valuable product is autonomously proliferating process. The Sense Lab is not an organization. It's not an institution. It's not a collective identity. It's an event-generating machine, a processual field that works to remain as creatively useless as possible. Its job is to generate outside prolongations of its activity that ripple into distant pools of potential and take seed. An idea becomes a seed for organization, which becomes a proposition for a concept, which becomes a problem for art, for politics, for, for philosophy, that may, if the conditions are ripe, resolve itself into the triggering of an event of collective experimentation and creative expression. Ripple effect. The process ripple has value in itself. When thought is at its most febrile and art at its most inventive, their ripplings are not up to measure, but they are up to the limit. The Sense Lab's call is to invent limit modes of collaboration that resist capture by the dominant economy that would seek to subsume them. As Nietzsche might say, was that life? Well then, once more in attunement to politics to come. Thank you.